And us. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to Our Solutions. I'm Stuart, the uh, Chief Exec for the Erlang. I'm uh, delighted you can join us. And I won't say very much in the intro other than you can see the slide that's up there. Our next large conference, some of you have been to this, I know already, um, previous years, uh, is CodeMesh, which is happening um, early November. The Lily Bird runs out next week, and if you use the um, discount code on the top there, you sell 10, you get 10% off. Do not try to sell. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, you already have enough because it, it won't work, but you will get a sense of discount if you use that. Have a look online if you are in any way interested in sharing, because there are some great uh, speakers at that. And Francesca could probably um, enlighten us as to who some of the comments are. I can't remember from my hands. So we've got Mario Seltzer, the big creator of Berkeley DB. We've got Guy Steele. David Turner. Yeah, David Turner. Mm. So let's say the power of functional programming. We don't have a Turing Award winner this year, but Not this year. we've made it up with other <coughs> But a, a, a great event, and it's, it's, it's dedicated, as you can see there, to alternative programming. So there's, there's lots of non-mainstream programming language uh, speakers there. So if, you want, if you're not already interested in it, it might come up with some of your it's, it's well worth it. It's pretty, pretty well priced as well. Anyway, with that little plug over, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Chandra, who's going to speak to us about building the idea of getting staff in the course of half an hour, which will be a challenge. Um, Chandru will introduce himself in terms of his background, but it involves um, many years uh, within telecoms, betting, and currently uh, fintech, uh, particularly uh, around earning and other things. So I'll say no more, but uh, thank you, Chandru. Thank you. Okay. Questions to the end or halfway through? Or? Um, anytime, really. That's okay. fine. Right. Yeah, we'll take it during the. <coughs> Hello everyone, <coughs> my name is Chandru. Um, so building an ideal betting stack. Um, basically the, oh, oh yes. Um, so the, the thought occurred when I was working at Bet365 because Bet365 has a lot of legacy to uh, deal with. Um, and so whenever we wanted to do anything <coughs> radical in terms of the architecture, there was always the problem of there's so much legacy to deal with and so you're, you're always patching stuff and incrementally evolving, which is fine. I mean, that's real life. But <coughs> uh, my, my take on it was, well, you need to imagine what an ideal betting stack always looks like so that you can always map a path from where you are to where you want to get to. Now, the ideal betting stack is going to evolve <coughs> as time goes by <coughs> and new stuff comes onto the horizon. You've got new components available, but it's, I think it's something which you need to constantly update and say, well, if I built it now from the ground up, this is what an ideal one would look like. So that at least you know um, where you have to get to from where you are. So a bit about me. I started programming when I was 12. Started getting paid to do it when I was 21. I've spent about 18 years in telecoms, um, both on the vendor side where I started working for Ericsson and then uh, most of it was with EE in the UK. Um, joined the betting industry in 2014 and currently working on an advertising startup. So we're building on our, our own ad server. Um, and I provide consulting for Lang Solutions. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said at the beginning, um, basically it's all about what would a betting stack look like if you built it from the ground up without having to deal with legacy. So I've sort of divided it into programming languages and uh, some operational tools and databases. So we'll just go by that. Um, obviously, our language OTP, I mean, uh, this, I gave this talk at a betting conference. Uh, so it, uh, Erlang would have been new to people. So how many, does everyone already use Erlang? And OK, or OK, so about half. So I'll, I'll still talk about why Erlang is a good choice. but. If it's getting boring, just heckle and I'll move on. Um, so it's, um, well, it's a functional programming language. Um, it's very expressive, so you can, you can actually express your business logic in very few lines of code. Um, it's optimized for multi-core. I think multi-core support appeared in 2008, um, probably the first time. And it's been improved on ever since. Um, so Erlang is really the language, and you've got OTP, which is basically a set of applications uh, built using Erlang. 
And that's a list of some big companies using it. Um, and you can see it's well, there's telecoms, there's advertising, there's betting, there's communications. So uh, it's used in quite a few diverse industries. Um, and so moving on, I mean, there's Elixir, which is the hip young offspring of Erlang. Um, um, it has a Ruby-like syntax, so if you're primarily a Ruby shop, but you still want to get the benefits of Erlang, then um, this might be for you. But I think people who are already experienced with Erlang tend to stick with it. I'm one of them. Uh, I've, I've tried looking at Elixir somehow. I think um, somehow it's, it's flipped around. I mean, previously when People used to complain about the syntax of Erlang. I used to say, well, what's the big deal? You know, it's just syntax. Can you not learn it? But every time I look at Elixir, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> I can't get my head around the syntax. So maybe uh, it is a thing that <laughs> um, um, it, it compiles down to core Erlang, um, and it runs on the Beam VM. So uh, you, st uh, you still get the. I suppose if you're primarily coming from the Ruby world, then you get a, get the best of both worlds. You get the syntax you like, and you get all the characteristics of the Beam VM. There are a few um, big companies already using it. Um, I don't know much about who's using it. I got this list from Stuart. So <laughs> if there is more, then um, great. You know, add it to the list. Um, so yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, I interrupt me anytime you want to talk about something in more detail. But <coughs> so I, so I included Go in here in terms of w programming languages to, which could be used because, well, I mean, Go is a better C in some ways. Um, it's got good support for concurrency with its uh, channels and uh, Go routines. Um, it's got ex excellent uh, cross-platform support, and the tool chain is is really nice. I mean, I, I really wish we had a tool chain similar to go in our line. Um, and we've got some way to go before we get there. And I think that's actually one of the, the, the support for concurrency and the tool chain is actually one of the main attractiveness for a lot of people, and that's why they're picking it up. Uh, but I mean, w why would I not use go for everything? Because I think. Um, if you're comfortable writing C code, then Go is great for you. You know, if you're already a, uh, a, a company where you use a lot of C and you're experienced with it and you can handle all the problems that come with it, then that's great. But I, but still, a lot of Go code ends up looking like C code, and uh, the biggest uh, well, one big problem is well the support of mutable uh, data. Now, uh, I mean, one of the main attractions of functional programming is that you have immutable data, so actually it's easier to reason about the code uh, and test it. Uh, whereas the problem with Go is it does support mutable data, so I the challenges would come with that. Um, uh, you make examples of uh, what's so cool about the tool chain? Well, um, so for example, uh, Cross-platform compilation, for example, so you can build, yeah, you can build pretty much in one place for diverse um, platforms. And the other thing is, you can you can basically package your whole application into a single binary. So actually, shipping it across is deployment is basically stick one binary in, uh, configure your initd or whatever, and then you're done. Whereas Erlang comes with a suitcase full of stuff. And you have to sort of, uh, th there is no easy way to deploy it. Um, so the, that is the end. Um, I mean, at Bet365, the, the gaming team tried to start using Erlang. And they were primarily developing on Windows. And, uh, and <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, so th there was a huge. Step. I mean, learning curve involved in how the heck do I make all this work in uh, Windows? And and some of the adjacent decoding libraries were like it was building. They were using NIFs, and well, okay, how do I build this on Windows now? Um, I I was not much help with them because I think the last time I wrote code on Windows was in 1997. So, 
Uh, it was just, um, it's just a learning. Whereas with Go, you can build for Windows on a Linux machine, and it will build a single binary. Um, <coughs> so middleware. Um, so again, uh, this is basically stuff which you use to interconnect. <coughs> Um, so I had um, I had I had to choose between Kafka and RabbitMQ, and actually I chose Kafka, even though it's not written in Erlang. Um, primarily because I think um, the the way it's been designed and built. Uh, so uh, how many people know or have used Kafka? Okay. Um, so basically, it's a high-performance um, messaging platform. Um, it's, well, I say ideal, but there are a lot of places where actually you can use it quite easily for interconnecting systems asynchronously. I mean, there's no, it's, it's, it's essentially a stored and forward system, if you like. Um, it has persistent replicated queues. Um, and it supports at least once, and I think recently they've rolled out support with exactly one semantics, um, which is quite handy to basically offload some of that complexity. Um, it comes with a few caveats, so it's not as straightforward as that, but um, at least it provides support for it, provided you develop your application within certain constraints. Um, and it supports this. Um, buzzword compliant uh, new design pattern called event sourcing. I mean, it makes sense. Um, event sourcing as a design pattern actually simplifies a lot of business logic here to build. Um, so to take a slightly deeper look at it, essentially you've got a Kafka cluster, uh, you've got producers, and you have what are called uh, DB connectors, which is basically something which uh, piggybacks onto the uh, databases, uh, uh, the write ahead logs, and it can stream it into a Kafka cluster. Um, you've got something called steam pr stream processors, which is essentially it consumes data coming out of Kafka, and it stores its output back in. So all you have to write is you don't have to worry about where the data is coming from and where it's being stored. Uh, Kafka streams, uh, the library handles all that for you. And you've got basically your bog standard consumers. So up and now here it's a bog standard pub sub. Um, so Kafka has this uh, notion of topics. So each topic is like, if you like, a logical collection of your messages. Uh, so if you're talking about betting, you could say that all bets um, for a certain fixture are in one topic. So that if you want to settle all the bets in a fixture, you consume all the uh, bets out of that, rather than going to your database, running a query saying, give me all bets which match this, and then try to do that. And you can have, um, and you got the concept of partitions, so that if you have a bunch of consumers here, uh, you can, uh, they can all consume simultaneously from all the partitions. So um, I mean, and, and the nice thing about Kafka is it's, it's the queues are a, the topics are a bit like a time machine. So you can you can consume it, but then you can always go back and say, right, I want to consume all the messages from a day or a month if you've got enough storage. Um, so you can keep going back to the same data um, without having to run queries on it. And uh, within a partition, the ordering is guaranteed. <coughs> um, the other um, nice um, mechanic, uh, well, interconnecting uh, component we have is this gRPC. Again, nothing revolutionary about it. It's just um, a common way of doing RPC between systems implemented in different languages, and. With, like with all these things, you know, standardization is nice. And as long as we can all agree that, OK, we talk gRPC, then you can talk to a C++ service writing written in Ruby or Java um, and uh, interconnect them without having to. I mean, previously, you could have done it with SOAP, or you can do it with REST uh, using HTTP. But 
in both of them, the problem is the, the, the transmission of messages is not optimized. So uh, gRPC uses a binary format, so it uses Google protocol buffers. Um, so the messages are packed much more efficiently on the wire. Uh, right. Um, right, so th these are the different communication mechanisms you get with gRPC. You get the uh, unary RPC, which is the traditional client server request response. Um, you've got server streaming RPCs where the client sends a single request and the server sends a, sends a stream of messages as a response. Um, or you've got um, client streaming RPCs where the client can send a series of messages um, and when it indicates that it's, it's sent everything there is to be sent, uh, it waits for a server response. Or there's bidirectional bi streaming. Um, it's about like, a bit like you and your spouse having an argument. You're both throwing stuff at each other and <laughs> at the same time. But, um, a, but a concrete example of that is, um, say you are uh, doing speech to text in real time. So what you can do is the client can be sending snippets of the speech in real time, and the server, as it decodes, sends you back stuff it has decoded. So you can have a single conversation where uh, it's a continuous stream of data. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, so it's mostly the case, but sometimes you've got to argue, right? <laughs> Um, any particular reason? Um, I think really only because um, gRPC is sort of more uh, up and coming, I guess. It's just that, I mean, Peter Hingens, he, he passed away recently as well. Um, I mean, I suppose you could do the same, but um, I don't know whether it has, I don't know ZeroMQ enough to know whether it supports all the use cases here. So I would say, uh, yeah, probably because I don't know much about ZeroMQ. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What we've also seen is if you're using some of your Google's infrastructure, it's a default uh, and uh, communication, so the standard would be an example. Yeah. And does zero MQ support like a request response, yeah. Uh, yeah. like RPC? Yeah. Okay, right. Uh, um, can you yeah, do a request yeah, response with that? I thought it was yeah, more yeah, a message yeah, bus. Yeah, no, you, 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 you can do a uh, reply to addresses, yeah. you can do correlation IDs. Yeah, use the correlation ID to, uh, to match, match the two up. So. Right, okay. Yeah, that's a, you can do that with Kafka too, in case you're already picking it up. Um, so, from an operations point of view, um, so there's Prometheus, um, which is basically a monitoring and al alerting system. Um, <coughs> so it supports a multidimensional data model. Basically what it is is for a single data point, you can attach a number of different labels to it. So when you query, you can say, um, give me all the data which, you know, where the labels match, and you can have fairly complex queries with it. Um, it's got a powerful query language. Um, and again, it's, it's uh, developed in, uh, in Go, so it basically comes as a single binary, so deployment is very easy. Um, and its default model is pulling metrics rather than uh, pushing. Um, and it scales quite well uh, with respect to uh, pulling metrics from a lot of systems. Um, it's, um, it's a CNCF project, so Actually, it plays quite well. Uh, sorry, CNCF is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation 
from where you you get this and you get gRPC and uh, this uh, yeah I'll, I'll talk more about the future ones but um, basically the cloud native forum is trying to build a set of technologies so that you can actually deploy systems easily in the cloud and you get all the good stuff easily without having to build it yourself um, so this um, open tracing uh, is basically an open standard for distributed tracing. Again, with all of these things, um, it's not that you can't do it yourself, but if you were doing everything yourself, then you can. But if you've got systems written in diverse languages and you want to integrate them, I think really all these, these things I'm putting out here are um, stuff which enables you to build um, systems in different languages and integrate them easily. So open tracing again is basically an, it's an open standard. All. <coughs> so imagine, so you've got um, quite a deep stack of requests coming into your system and then it traverses multiple systems and a response goes back to the user. Now you want to know how, uh, you know, how long a certain request is, staying, is taking on each leg of uh, the stack. Um, <coughs> I mean, if if you didn't have open uh, open tracing and you wanted to build it, the the logical way is well, let each uh, system emit um, emit an event saying, "This is the correlation ID of the if of the request I'm dealing with. I started here, I finished here, <laughs> and let it traverse through." Um, and that's pretty much really what open tracing is. It just defines the standard so that you don't have to argue about how to implement it. Um, so there, there's an example of um, a request flowing from the client and a number of systems at the, um, at the back being invoked. <coughs> um, and what it does is it, it enables easy visualization of execution flow in distributed systems. Um, because as when you're writing a distributed system, you don't want to think about you know how to do all this you just uh, it's nice to have a standard so you can just build to it and focus on your business logic instead um, and you can uh, visualization using uh, open source tools such as Zipkin and Jaeger um, so that is based that is an example um, of a service execution flow visualized in Zipkin so you you get the nice um, stack visualized and you can see how much time uh, your, your, whole, your systems are spending in each leg. <coughs> and actually there are, and this is basically a competing visualization tool uh, which Uber released uh, called Jaeger, which does pretty much similar, it's quite similar to um, Zipkin, but what it also has is a, it has mechanisms for back pressure so that if your systems are generating a lot of tracing traffic, it can basically uh, push back and say, can you back off a bit? I can't deal with all this. Um, configuration management, again, um, on the face of it, fairly simple to do, but then you start doing it at the, for a lot of systems, you run into a lot of uh, problems. Um, so, Again, this, this is another CNCF project called ETCD, <coughs> which is a distributed key value store. Um, it's useful um, as a centralized configuration store. It has the ability to push uh, messages out to subscribers when configuration has changed. Um, and uh, what they basically also say is, uh, I haven't used it for this, but you can use it to implement distributed coordination um, but so I mean configuration is something we all we all deal with in different ways and um, and every language you use specifies a different way of how you can specify your uh, how you can specify your configuration um, I, I've, I've pretty much used um, every different way of doing it and Eventually, I've come to the conclusion that actually centralizing your configuration and let systems pull their configuration from a centralized store is a better way of managing it than having it in configuration files. Like, for example, in Erlang, 
Um, you can put your configuration in sysconfig files, but then you have the problem of, right, I have a different sysconfig for, um, for all my various environments. I've got different um, configuration file for each node type I have. And just getting a sense of, well, is the configuration right across uh, a cluster of systems? It's kind of hard to do. Um, whereas if you could centralize it within a data store like that, which which has the ability to, um, uh, which which gives you high availability so that you can actually deploy CDA as a cluster and make sure your configuration is highly available and when there's a change, it can push messages out to the connected clients. I think it's, it's quite useful. Um, and, um, Databases, um, obviously the, the heart of most systems. Um, so in terms of well, SQL databases, you've got lots of choices, but uh, I think in uh, Postgres, um, maybe if I was building a betting site today, I'd probably start with using Postgres for if I needed a SQL database. Um, um, I mean, obviously, it's got high performance and large install base. Actively developed, I think, recently, Postgres 10 was released. Um, license free, and it, you can easily find people who can uh, help you with it as well. Um, the next thing um, is React. Um, how many people have worked with React? Right. It's a well. It's 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 a distributed NoSQL database. Um, what it really gives you is um, various control levers so that you can trade off consistency for availability depending on your use case. So the the classic example. It's based on the Amazon Dynamo paper which came out a long time ago. Uh, the classic example is well, if you've got a if you're dealing with a shopping cart then actually you want high availability and you don't really bother worry so much about consistency because before a customer pays, they're always going to check. And if you've added a product twice or if you put back a product in which they've removed previously, they probably won't be too upset about it because they're going to check anyway and remove it again. Um, whereas at the point of placing an order and you're committing to it, you want to make sure that you've actually recorded it and you don't lose that data. Um, and what React basically gives you is that those control levers so that you can say, I want this request to be consistent so that uh, all the replicas answer. Or you can say, as long as somebody's got a copy of this, I'm fine with it. Um, it's got built-in CRDT support. Um, basically, CRDTs are data types which <coughs> which help you resolve inconsistencies automatically, even if you've got multiple, uh, multiple clients modifying the same data, it, it gives you the ability to uh, resolve inconsistencies for you. Inconsistencies typically arise from net splits in your database. Um, um, I mean, it, it is by a certain set of rules. So as long as you, you model your data so that it can it can be designed using CRDTs, then actually a lot of it comes to you for free. Um, it's based on the Amazon Dynamo paper. <coughs> um, and pr probably you've heard recently that Basho uh, as a company went, went bust, but um, I think luckily for the rest of us, Bet365 bought out the IP for uh, the source in React and they're open sourcing, well, they said they will open source um, the parts which are not, which are only available to enterprise users. Um, I don't know, probably you are, you know more about the plans to open source. I think there was a talk a few weeks ago. Yeah, the um, it's the deal, the deal that needs formal court approval in the states, which happens this Friday. Um, and then their plan is to open source it. There's a two day workshop tomorrow and Friday in Stoke where they've invited anyone in the React community who wants to participate, particularly go along with the part to get their guidance, to get people's input on, on roadmap, how the community should work, and a whole host of other licensing issues, the rest of it. Um, but 
certainly in the very near future, they intend to open source everything that's already out there. And we're working on, we just released um, updated packages now for React with most um, recent versions of Erlang. Uh, we'll, we'll maintain those to make sure that there's an easy place to download them. Um, so that you can use them and the support that you can work with. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, so yeah, as a as a summary, I think from a betting point of view, um, that is how I would classify a choice of technology for implementing various parts of your betting stack. Um, so as you can see, Erlang Elixir, there's a lot of real time stuff um, which needs to scale and be stable. Uh, Golang, I think I would use it for data transformation tools and operational utilities purely because uh, of its speed of execution and the ease of uh, deploying them. Um, well, a betting stack needs a lot of um, actually UI applications for traders to um, manage your operation. And actually, you could do them as web applications, but I think it's a <coughs> It's a lot easier probably to just um, build applications, UI applications on Windows. Um, and you don't have to worry about browser compatibility. But, um, and then there's uh, PostgreSQL for um, storing uh, all your customer subscription data. Um, and again, I mean, I think with a SQL and a NoSQL database, you, you could um, you could put both you could implement it in both ways, but I think the cha the set of challenges are different. Um, so it it comes down to it comes down to how comfortable you are with using either one of them. And sometimes I think um, the expertise you have in house trumps uh, what some other technology can provide, even though it's slightly better. The the cost of adopting a new technology for, uh, for an organization is quite high. And um, so yeah. So I, I, I can understand Postgres for the subscriber <coughs> information, but for the bets, I'd be concerned about um, uh, uh, you're betting 24 by 7. And obviously, something like Postgres, you've got a certain amount of maintenance down the front. So yeah, I mean, um, uh, how, how do you deal with that? So, I mean, you can always shard your database across so that you are you do rolling upgrades or so that your customer base in I mean my point there is actually react is great in some ways it gives you some capabilities but it's not for free it's not easy yeah. to use it uh, because you you still have to what it's doing is basically moving all the complexity up to the application level so y you actually have to think about all those things um, and at least um, <coughs> having seen it in use in Betsy successfully, they've used it successfully, but it's not by any means easy, uh, both from a design and development point of view and an operation. Uh, I mean React. Um, both from a design and development perspective and also an operational perspective. It doesn't come for free. There is a lot of uh, complexity involved in it. So if as an organization you, you um, you don't have the time to build up that capability and you're more comfortable with the SQL database. There are ways you can manage your operation. Um, yeah, it's just a different set of... Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, from my point of view, you, you can do it in either one of them. It's just, um, ultimately, it's, I, I think a choice of technology isn't just about, is it the best in, from an idealistic programmer point of view, but it's more, what's, what are the costs for me as an organization to actually adopt this? And sometimes, if you pick something up like React, and, but your entire development team knows nothing about, um, either Erlang or the cap theorem or eventual consistency, then by the time you get to grips with it and launch a product, 
you you're probably way behind the market. So you're better off sticking to something like that. It's. I didn't say you mentioned Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I deliberately stayed away from it because I just thought, actually, at least in my point of view, I think it's one of those things where. Um, I don't know, it's probably heretical these days to say you can live without it. Um, it's almost become, uh, in some places, an end in itself rather than a means to an end. I think, yes, sure, it's there, and uh, I can see the value of it uh, in terms of having, you know, the, the so that you don't have arguments about, well, it runs okay in development, and it runs in UAT, why is it not running in production? And it, it gets you over those challenges, but I think, um, it, it's probably not a necessary condition, I would say. You can, you can live without it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, but I, I actually wanted to make one announcement as part of this. I talked about gRPC earlier. We, um, gRPC has sub libraries for about nine or 10 different languages. We've well, we've, we've open sourced an application uh, which provides gRPC, both client and server support in Erlang. Um, it's been open source for about a month or so now, but I thought I'll announce it officially. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I wonder if you are aware of any benefits of Erlang over LTS. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm biased in that because I've been I've been using Erlang for a long time. I I prefer the. Sours and lunchy jobs today. Yep. Oh, I'm making the back. Sit down and get warm and eat it. I think you can mix it. Yeah, see, my, my view is I think Erlang is a simpler language. Um, well, you really yeah, I mean, like I said, if you are if you are if you are heavily involved with Ruby, but you want the the goodies of uh, the Beam VM, actually Elixir is an easier probably adoption path for you. But Erlang, I think, is a simpler language, uh, uh, whereas Elixir has got a lot of. Once you got under that initial learning curve, I think that's the trouble is, is, is that initial learning curve is very stiff and, uh, and it looks very difficult to use. But once you've done that, it becomes a really easy language to use. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, th there's very little of the language, so you can learn the language quickly, mm -hmm. but I think the, the bigger challenges you have in implementing a distributed system is actually. Um, getting your head around the challenges of dealing with concurrency. So I think, at least in my view, if the language is simple enough, then you can move on to the hard parts of actually now dealing with concurrency in a system. Uh, because that's never easy. Um, but as I, I think the view I hear in the Erlang community is, and I might be wrong, it's just that Elixir is adding more and more features to the language. and that's not necessarily always a good thing. So uh, I think almost every old time Erlang programmer you speak to will say, I'm fine, thanks, I'll stick to Erlang. But I, mean, I think Elixir is great in that it's attracting a new audience. Erlang was always seen as a bit old and stuffy and boring and. The one thing I'm really jealous of, Elixir has got better documentation, better tooling, it's got fewer commodities and bastards on the name. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> but I would like to see some of that energy be in main on the third Yeah, you're right. I mean, the. I would say the opposite. I like Erlang because it's less excessive. So there is like, you know, I won't see so many JavaScript developers using it. You know what I mean? 
I like, I like you know, the big, the big tent fallacy. I don't want these retards coming in. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, on your decision to choose uh, the message of this company, so what, what was the priority? <coughs> um, <coughs> so, my priorities with it actually were scalability okay. and, um, and stability. And um, I've heard from several places that actually RabbitMQ suffers under load. And I can sort of relate to that because um, I must say I've, I haven't encountered the stability issues, but I've heard from pretty reliable quarters that actually under load RabbitMQ it, builds up message queues. Stuff, so yeah, and the you've got to monitor that quite closely because you, you can lose a lot of messages when you're creating a request for a government member of the I mean, uh, my. Yeah, and it. Well, I mean, okay, you, you know, I, I take your point that. I, no, I take your point about Zookeeper, but I think at some point, someone is going to replace the leader election with probably something like Raft or, you know, uh, Zookeeper is there, but I don't think that is your main problem. My main problem with RabbitMQ is that it uses Amnesia under the hood. And <coughs> from a previous life, I know that amnesia hits problems beyond a certain scale. Now, OK, you can, I mean, I, I got bitten badly by it. Uh, I, I, I was at one time, I think I had the claim to fame that I was the biggest amnesia cluster I had. I was running. Uh, but at that time, nobody knew about WhatsApp, so it's a different story. Um, but beyond a certain point, it becomes quite unstable in this. Uh, admittedly, I should have done more edge uh, load control, but it blew up spectacularly in our faces quite a few times. And my, my uh, yes, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I currently consult for a company which uses Rabbit and I use it, but um, I haven't seen load figures and how it, how it Yeah, yeah. Which is actually quite even handed, I thought, as to the pros and cons of both and recognise that there were excellent and different yeah. use cases. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think, cases. think I mean, there are all different use cases. This guy, yeah. as we mentioned yesterday, was at uh, Clemens Vastis, the, the Microsoft guy. And so we picked the sort of Kafka esque model for Azure IoT Hub because it just scaled better to our needs. But if you want this, we've got some whistles. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this, this talk is from the perspective of a betting stack. And for a betting stack, I think really. The use cases are more simple. It's just I've got a stream of data and I want to consume it as fast as I yeah, can. And I think this place both. In our, in our stack, we're currently using RabbitMQ for almost all of our message types, but we're looking really chunky on the Kafka because we don't need those guarantees. Yeah, yeah. And we get much better performance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and uh, like I said, I um, I personally haven't encountered the stability issues in RabbitMQ, but I'm putting two and two together in terms of I've, I've heard from very reliable sources. Uh, who have personally gone to experience the pain of unstable rabbit clusters, and uh, my own experience with amnesia in terms of instability under load. So, uh, like I said, this is an ideal wedding stack from my point of view. 
And I, I think it, 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 if I needed a middleware component for a betting stack, I would put Kafka there. Yeah. Yeah, that's like an ancient version. 3.3. 3. 3. <laughs> so there's a lot of problems. We're not, we're not that customer, but we are using 3.3. Uh, also, Tarabelli, 1.3.6 top. So, we're not using the last track. I'm not using the last track. Just a question on Kafka. How extensible is it? So, with Rapid, you can, uh, you've got this concept of interceptors. Any mm. So Yeah, the closest thing you have to that is a stream processor. So basically, uh, you, you consume from a topic, yeah. you transform it, and you stick it back in another topic. So it's 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 not the same thing, but that's the closest Kafka has. No, I'm I see, seriously, I'm not trying to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not. Uh, I'm not saying. Um, Kafka is better than RabbitMQ in every in every way. It's just that um, knowing the the kind of traffic flows in betting, I would I think uh, use Kafka over RabbitMQ. What's the latency does Kafka I mean, it it very much depends on how fast you're able to consume it. And because you have the ability to have multiple consumers for the same topic, um, the, the, the latency very much depends on how fast are you able to consume it. So, I mean, uh, people typically report they can consume millions of messages a second, but uh, we are not operating Kafka at that scale. So, uh, but that's never been our bottleneck. Sorry, when I say we, uh, we, um, <coughs> uh, uh, Bet365 was evaluating Kafka for their use, but not, not in traffic handling, but more uh, traffic analysis, uh, which, is, which is sort of out of the critical path. But um, we are using Kafka in our own product. Um, okay. I mean, I've, I've only worked with odds betting. I haven't worked with spread betting, so I can't really comment on that. But for odds betting, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're, also, you're also running cash out systems which have got to produce in real time um, any number of cash out positions as requested by punters. So if you want to cash out, you better have I think, yeah, I mean, <coughs> for, for communication between Erlang systems, I would just use native Erlang. Uh, I wouldn't use native RPC, but I would use fairly simple TCP socket based uh, term to binary, binary to term. I mean, that's, uh, that works. Actually, for, for unary RPCs, we found that uh, um, a very simple RPC application we wrote ourselves performs much better than gRPC because you don't have the whole HTTP overhead um, and it's much simpler. But so within a, between Erlang systems, I can't really see the value of using gRPC. But the thing is, um, it's, it's nowadays it's a very heterogeneous environment you find yourself in. And if you insist on sticking to 
Erlang turn to binary stuff, um, I integration becomes harder. Though it's more efficient. I mean, uh, yeah, simple term to binary over a socket is way always more way more efficient than the HTTP2 encoding uh, of data. Okay. So he's using an uh, approach called Sentinel, which um, just scales way beyond the other system. Yeah. This will be the area of the system, which is going to take place with this day here. So, yeah, that's next word that we'll be announcing tomorrow. Is that something here? Yeah, yeah. How much of your use cases are the transaction? Um, I think so, specifically, in what context? So you see, are we talking about RabbitMQ or ah, the right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, so s in the context of betting. Yeah. Um, how much of it is transactional? Well, your bet placement is transactional. Um, your your distribution of odds updates is